a list of all individuals ethnically cleansed from the village of Tarshiha in the north of the country with names, ages, occupations. Tell us the most surprising thing that blew your mind in your research, Josh, about the origins of the 1948 Nakba and U.S. involvement. I would say the degree to which U.S. diplomats knew in precise detail the ethnic cleansing of Palestinians that Israel was committing in 1948, the fact that U.S. diplomats understood that the systematic Israeli destruction of Palestinian homes, the systematic looting of Palestinian possessions was all a part of this ethnic cleansing campaign to drive Palestinians from their homeland. The degree to which the United States knew about these things is shocking. I found, for example, in the archives of the United States, a list of all individuals ethnically cleansed from the village of Tarshiha in the north of the country with names, ages, occupations. This level of detail was transmitted by U.S. humanitarian NGOs to the State Department. So the U.S. knew in such great detail that hasn't been exposed yet just how systematic Israel's ethnic cleansing was of the Palestinian people in 1948. Josh Rubner, welcome to Fort Wayne uh, and the Indiana Center for Middle East Peace. It's a real privilege, Josh. I want you to know it's a real privilege to have you here. Well, thank you so much for having me. Let's get right to it, uh, Josh. Day 97 of Israel's genocidal assault on Gaza. Almost 30,000 Gazans killed, 60,000 wounded, 70% uh, women and children, 40% children, 85% of the people have been forced from their homes, 70% of the homes demolished. The statistics are staggering in themselves but they mask each one is a unique individual, a, a dad, a mom, a, a child, a brother, sister, etc. cetera. Three and a half percent of Gaza's 2.3 million uh, people. And as you've, men as you've mentioned, 90% of Gaza's 2.3 million people uh, dispossessed. Um, talk to us about just the, the human toll that we're experiencing in Gaza here. It's shocking, it's staggering, it's incomprehensible. There have been studies and reports put out by historians who have said that the impact on civilians in Gaza has been one of the most intensive uh, levels of violence inflicted on a civilian population in history. Uh, exceeding, in some cases, the civilian suffering during World War II. So the scale of the suffering is tremendous. UN humanitarian organizations have said repeatedly that the scale of this humanitarian catastrophe is unlike anything that they've seen in the past. The fact is that there are now an estimated 577,000 Palestinians in the Gaza Strip who are facing famine conditions right now as we speak. And those numbers are expected to go up because of Israel's brutal siege. And in fact, four out of every five human beings who's facing famine in the world, the whole entire world today, four out of every five are those Palestinians in that tiny piece of land known as the Gaza Strip. So the impact is hard to overstate. The level of violence that Israel has inflicted on Palestinian civilians in the Gaza Strip over the past three months now in gross terms is more Palestinians killed than in 1948 when Israel uprooted most of the Palestinian people from their homelands. In that ethnic cleansing campaign of 1948, it was estimated that Israel killed an estimated 12 to 15,000 Palestinians. So mm. now we're at the point where the fatality count in just three months of Israeli attacks on Palestinians in Gaza has now more than doubled the number of Palestinians killed during the Nakba. If we have any uh, comparison 
in, in gross terms of the sheer destruction of what we're talking about. We have to compare Israel's attack against Palestinians in the Gaza Strip to Israel's attack and war upon Lebanon in 1982. A uh, war that targeted both Lebanese civilians and Palestinian refugees in Lebanon. During that summer of 1982, during an analogous period of time, there were about 20,000 deaths. So we've seen that Israel has now by far surpassed the previous most deadly attack against civilians. So we're really in uh, unprecedented charters, and my fear when I hear Israeli politicians talking about this uh, campaign lasting months and potentially even right. years is that Israel is fully committed with full U.S. backing to continue this punishing assault against Palestinian civilians who simply won't be able to withstand it, never mind the bombs. Obviously, the bombs are doing a ton of killing, but the starvation and the dehydration and the lack of access to medicine and other fundamental needs that everyone needs to live, how long can these conditions be sustained before there are mass, mass, mass fatalities in terms of the hundreds of thousands, in terms of even millions of people either being killed or being ethnically cleansed from the Gaza Strip into Egypt, which I fear is also an Israeli end goal in this campaign. We've been holding Protest Tuesday uh, rallies every Tuesday since October 7th at the Allen County Courthouse here. And virtually every week I've been saying this is not uh, Israel's assault, uh, uh, not a war against Hamas, not a war against Gaza, not even a war against the Palestinian people, but a war on Palestinian history, mm. culture, tradition, a war against the very idea of Palestine itself, uh, erasing Palestine from human memory, truly the very definition of genocide. Your comment. Yeah, I agree. Beyond the devastation on the human level, there is tremendous devastation to the cultural and archaeological and historical being of Palestinians in the Gaza Strip. So for example, Israel has destroyed three churches, and I don't know how many hundreds of mosques in the Gaza Strip so far. Every single university in the Gaza Strip has been targeted and destroyed by Israel. Hospitals have been destroyed. The archives of the Gaza City municipality have been destroyed. Historical sites have been destroyed. So yes, this goes well beyond the targeting of civilians to attack as well Palestinian history and culture. And as you mentioned, that is a part of the definition of genocide and should be part of the case that is being brought to bear right now in the International Court of Justice. You're uh, in a unique position to answer that this because of your studies. And this isn't just since October 7th. I mean, this is this is the outgrowth, right, of a hundred year plus uh, uh, agenda, uh, Zionist agenda to uh, ethnically cleanse Palestine of Palestinians. Well, look, Israel is a settler colonial state, just like the United States is. And at the heart of all settler colonial efforts is a drive to eliminate the native, as Patrick Wolf described in his seminal article about the mechanisms of settler colonialism. And what we can learn from Patrick Wolf and other scholars of settler colonialism and genocide is that genocide is not always a component of settler colonialism, but oftentimes it is. And so I think what we're seeing today is an intensification and a continuation of Israel's original drive in 1948 to dispossess the Palestinian people from their homeland, to commit vast acts of ethnic cleansing. And as I mentioned before, it's taking place on an even greater and more devastating scale than in 1948. So it's really concerning where things are headed, especially given the fact that the Israeli government is filled with cabinet ministers who have made yeah. genocidal statements against the Palestinian people, including Israel's prime minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, who said that Israel are the children of light and Palestinian are the children of darkness. We know from history 
that preceding every single genocide or attempted genocide against a people, it's been preceded by their dehumanization in terms of the, this genocidal rhetoric that we're seeing from Israeli leaders. Whether we look at the Ottoman genocide in Armenia, whether we look at the Nazi genocide against the Jewish people and others in Europe, uh, whether we look at the genocide that occurred in the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda, all of these were preceded by these vast public propaganda campaigns to dehumanize the other. And this is definitely what we're seeing as well. You know, it strikes me as we're talking here that maybe not in every case, but in many cases of this sort of uh, ethnic cleansing and genocidal assault, that a characteristic of each one, of many of them is a religious legitimization or justification. And certainly with Netanyahu's comments about uh, children of light and darkness, mm -hmm. the uh, Amalekites and other kind of comments, not only by him, but other cabinet ministers, settlers and others, and especially in this country, of course, uh, with uh, uh, Christian Zionists, you find this religious legitimization of ethnic cleansing and genocide. Well, I'll go back to the theories of Patrick Wolf, who wrote By the way, excuse me, I, I was going to ask you, so blend this in. Mm -hmm. I read that you're teaching this course, uh, Justice and Peace in Palestine and Israel at Georgetown. Yes. And he, his book, his seminal book, is required reading in that class mm -hmm. for your students about settler colonialism. So forgive me for interrupting, but since you've referred to it now a couple of times, I thought I'd give a plug for your class, even though it's maxed out now at 25, I read. Yes. Anyway, go ahead. Yes. <laughs> uh, no, definitely what Patrick Wolf talks about in his seminal article uh, about Wait, settler sorry. colonialism and the elimination of the native is that he talks about how control of territory is what is at the heart of all settler colonial movements and what provides the drive and the impetus to their elimination of the native. And what Patrick Wolf says in his article, which is something I agree with, is that the racism and the religious uh, underpinnings form a sort of secondary justification. But the primary justification is always the territorial component mm -hmm. of needing to um, expand and to dispossess the indigenous people from the land in order to accomplish that expansion. So yes, the type of religiously driven rhetoric we've seen both from religious Israeli political leaders and from secular Israeli political leaders because you know the Bible was also used by David Ben-Gurion, the first Israeli prime minister, as a justification and as a pretext for him committing the ethnic cleansing that he was responsible for in 1948. So that's always been a strand that's been there uh, in order to justify for Israelis and make them feel um, good about what they're doing. We're here on, uh, what, uh, January the uh, 11th, and today, right, South Africa brought its case to the International Court of Justice uh, accusing Israel of uh, genocide. So I want you to comment on that, but I also want you to comment on the fact that, you know, for many of us who are, who are part of this work, the UN, uh, 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 International Human Rights Law, ICJ, the uh, IC International Criminal Court, while, while these kinds of cases, and I know each one of these organizations is different, but these cases are so important and bring us so much hope and yet we don't find much teeth mm -hmm. in even when uh, these organizations agree. And so talk to us about uh, uh, the importance of this case at the ICJ and what, what hopeful result might come of it. Right. Well, let's talk about first the history of the Convention Against Genocide. This was an international convention that was the brainchild of someone by the name of Raphael Lemkin, who was an international lawyer, right. a Jewish a Holocaust survivor who fled Nazi-occupied Europe and immigrated to the United States. And he made it his life's work to get this international treaty agreed to uh, that would make genocide a crime, a term that he coined. 
So this was something that was uh, agreed upon by the United Nations General Assembly in 1948, so 75 years ago, roughly. And it makes it a supreme crime against humanity to commit acts of genocide. Now, there's a popular notion because of how intimately tied the word genocide is into the horrors of the Nazi Holocaust that genocide means mass extermination of millions of people. And it can mean that, but that's not what it means according to the international convention making genocide a crime. Intent is part of this as well, isn't it? Intent is part <laughs> of its measures that are designed to make life impossible for part or whole of a group. So mass extermination might be a component of a genocidal campaign, but mass extermination is not necessary to rise to the level of the crime of genocide. So when we look at the totality of Israel's policies that's, that it's inflicting against Palestinians in the Gaza Strip, the indiscriminate bombing, the wholesale destruction of infrastructure, the repeated targeting of hospitals, the destruction, as we talked about, of educational facilities and universities and cultural and historic uh, landmarks of the Palestinian people in Gaza. Combine that with the fact that Israel is forcibly depriving Palestinians of adequate food, water, and medicine. Of course, all of these things add up to a calculated policy of denying the conditions of life necessary for the Palestinian people in Gaza. So South Africa has brought a very compelling case forward to the ICJ to make a ruling on whether Israel is indeed guilty of committing the crime of genocide. And should the ICJ find that Israel is committing the crime of genocide, the ICJ has the power to rule that Israel should halt its military operations and it can also make recommendations that other member states that are parties to the Genocide Convention, which include the United States, by the way, have to take certain measures not to be complicit with this genocide and to take active measures to stop the genocide from uh, occurring. So it's very, it's very significant. It's very important. I don't believe that Israel or the United States will abide by whatever the ICJ says, if the ICJ rules in favor of South Africa's complaint. But I think that there is a strong possibility that many other nations will abide by the ICJ ruling, and that could have profound ramifications. I'm, I'm going to ask you uh, an impossibly broad question uh, to answer, but I want you to talk about your dissertation research <clears throat> a little bit. and. You mentioned uh, one of the most surprising things uh, uh, that you discovered in your research. But um, talk to us about the origins of, you know, talk to us about Truman's involvement, what led up to the U.S. Uh, approving the, or, or, or furthering this uh, U.N. support for the establishment of the State of Israel. Talk to us about that period of time, the 1940s, coming out of the Holocaust, moving into the establishment of the State of Israel, and just some of the things you found there. Sure. I think I'll start the discussion with the 1947 UN General Assembly recommendation to partition Palestine into two states and how that came about, and some of the misconceptions about both the partition recommendation and the Truman administration's approach to it. So there, as the British laid down their responsibilities for its mandate to govern Palestine and turned to the UN to make a recommendation as to what should be done, there was a delegation sent out to Palestine to investigate the circumstances and to make a recommendation. There was a majority report of this UN committee, which was called UNSCOP, the UN Special Committee on Palestine, and a minority report. Guess what? Both of the major both the majority report and the minority report were written by the same person. 
<laughs> an American Indian diplomat Indian. at the UN by the name of Dr. Ralph Bunch, who would go on to win the Nobel Peace Prize in 1950, I believe, for his role in brokering armistice agreements between Israel and its neighbors in 1949. He also played this very seminal role in 1947 in writing both of the reports. So the majority report recommended that Palestine be divided into two countries, a Jewish state and an Arab state. Doesn't that sound fair? Doesn't that sound logical when you have this competing Zionist movement and Palestinian nationalism just split the baby in half is basically what Ralph Bunch wrote in the majority report. The minority report said, well, maybe it doesn't make so much sense to have two separate independent sovereign states within this geographic border. There should be uh, two, two federated states, but not fully independent. However, when Ralph Bunch wrote these majority and minority reports, the Zionist movement, despite 30 years of almost unfettered support from Great Britain, encouraging the close settlement of the Jewish people on the land, as is mentioned in the Balfour Declaration and the British Mandate, they only comprised about one third of the population of Palestine at the time, about 600,000 people. And the Zionist movement only was able to purchase less than 7% of the land of Palestine in that time, okay? On the other hand, Palestinians, through the, being the owners of the public lands and through private land holdings, owned 93% of the land and comprised two-thirds of the population, 1.2 million. So here the UN comes in and the UN says, well, we think Israel should get, or the Jewish state should get 55% of the land of Palestine. And there should be an Arab state in about 42% with an international enclave in and around Jerusalem. And so the Palestinian delegation to the UN at the time made very articulate um, and, and very persuasive arguments that this was a violation of self-determination. Yeah. That by what right did the UN have to say, I think your homeland should be divided and given to a minority settler colonial movement that owned a bare fraction of the land? So Palestinians are often blamed for rejecting the partition recommendation, but who can blame them for rejecting it? It was a violation of their self-determination. It was not the UN's role to come in and take away their land from them, which is in essence what they recommended to do. Now, the Truman administration, to get to your question, I'm sorry for all the no, extraneous background, the Truman administration said, well, we're gonna support the UN uh, Special Committee on Palestine's majority recommendation, not for any principled reason, but because the Truman administration thought that it was important to provide support for a majority recommendation of a UN committee because the Truman administration played a seminal role in standing up the United Nations in the aftermath of World War II. There was no principled reason why the Truman administration supported the partition recommendation. But here's where it gets interesting, Michael. To its credit, about three weeks after the decision was made, to recommend the partitioning of Palestine into two states, the State Department said, this is never going to work. Not only is this a violation of Palestinian self-determination, read the UN General Assembly resolution. It says that the idea of partitioning Palestine has to be done with the consent of both the Zionist organizations running Mandatory Palestine, the Jewish community in Mandatory Palestine, and representative Palestinians. It was premised on a consensual agreement between those two. And the Truman administration, as early as December 1947, recognized that this was not going to come about, that the actual implementation of how the partition was supposed to be would not be feasible. And therefore, the Truman administration actually pulled their support 
for partitioning Palestine in March of 1948. And they went back to the United Nations and they said this partition is not going to work. Instead, it needs to be under a UN trusteeship until a time that the Palestinian people and the Zionist organizations speaking on behalf of the Jewish community in Palestine could come to a different agreement on the outcome. This is what the United States was pushing for up until the expiration of the British mandate on May 14, 1948. They were literally pressing for that up until the very moment when on the ticker tape in the UN, it said that the Truman administration had recognized the new state of Israel. The US delegation to the UN was not even informed that the president was going to do that. And you know how they found out? One of, one of the aides on the US delegation to the UN went into the office of the secretary general and found in the waste paper basket a little crumpled up note saying the US recognized the state of Israel at 6.11 PM. And then they had to go back and say, we're sorry, we didn't know that this was happening. So there was a complete uh, disarray within US policy after the Truman administration decided in this very precipitate manner to recognize the state of Israel. Uh, and, you know, to be honest, it was all for, I, I won't say all for, but mainly for electoral consumption. And the secondary consideration being that the United States had to beat the Soviet Union to the recognition of Israel. Uh, so that's why they had to be first, first in line so that the Soviet Union wouldn't gain an entree of influence into the region. Uh, wow. So that's some of what I found out in the, in the course of my research. But I think the much more interesting uh, component of my research has to deal with your question at the outset of the degree to which the United States knew about Israel's ethnic cleansing yeah. of the Palestinians in 1948. And another surprising thing I found was the degree to which the United States insisted upon the repatriation of Palestinian refugees to Israel in 1948 and 1949. They said at least one third of the refugees who had been forcibly displaced from their homes had to be allowed back. And President Truman himself actually said that he was, quote, rather disgusted by Israel's treatment yeah. of Palestinian refugees. Well, I look forward to reading your dissertation. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I have a two-part question for you. One of, one of the most frustrating things is the absolute bias of Western media, absolute bias. Um, uh, so on the one hand, you have that. On the other hand, and maybe there are just two sides of the same coin, Israel is targeting Palestinian journalists mm -hmm. now. Over 100 have been killed since uh, the first part of October. There is a war on truth, mm -hmm. uh, uh, murdering those who would tell the truth, an all-out propaganda war in the West, but with a complicit Western media. Mm -hmm. So talk about why this absolutist support of the Israeli narrative and then also the targeting of Palestinian journalists uh, uh, in Gaza and in the West Bank. Mm -hmm. I'll take the second question first. Uh, the targeting of journalists in the Gaza Strip by Israel is very deliberate. It's very evident. And yes, it's an attempt by Israel to suppress their reporting of the fact of what's happening. All of this is very obvious. And this is not the first campaign where Palestinian journalists have paid a heavy price just a couple of years ago. Israel assassinated the Palestinian American journalist Shirin Abu Akleh, yeah. probably with a US gun, probably with a US bullet that killed this US citizen. And the United States still has not held Israel accountable for this cold blooded assassination of uh, an American citizen journalist. So this is not new. This is something that has been going on for quite some time. Uh, to be a Palestinian journalist is the most dangerous uh, form of journalism there is in the entire world because of this deliberate Israeli targeting. 
Now, in terms of the media narrative in the United States, I think it's also important to note that there have been very positive developments in this regard, especially over the last generation. It used to be the case that it was nearly impossible for either a Palestinian living in Palestine or a Palestinian American living in this country to get their voices heard in mainstream media, either through the op-ed pages or through uh, interviews on cable TV. Uh, that dynamic has changed to a degree so that it is now very possible for you to open the pages of your mainstream newspaper that you read or read online uh, or the some of the television programs that you might see, including on uh, outlets like CNN and MSNBC and PBS and those types of stations that do not always, but sometimes feature uh, incredible analysts and uh, intellects who are Palestinian, Palestinian American, and other people who support Palestinian rights. So the situation has changed. Um, it's not as unfiltered and unbiased as it should be. Uh, I think that there's still a lot of uh, pressure being placed on news editors in particular in terms of how headlines should be written. So oftentimes you'll see if there is a Palestinian attack on an Israeli, oftentimes that will be in the active voice. But oftentimes what will happen in the mainstream media is that Israel's actions toward Palestinians will be described in the passive voice. So yeah. Palestinians are being starved in Gaza. Yeah. By whom? By aliens from Mars? <laughs> I mean, do your fundamental basic job as a journalist of the who, what, when, why, where, right? Israel is doing the starving deliberately, according to Human Rights Watch. So, you know, we often have uh, problems in terms of how the narrative is being framed, often coming from higher ups in the newsroom. Let me follow up on that. Um, I used to call Congress uh, occupied territory, and I we never bothered to write letters to the Congress. I mean, it's just, especially in Indiana, of course, it just seemed like a waste of energy and time. Uh, but but there, there are hopeful developments. I mean, you're from D.C., so you, and you deal with members of Congress and especially staff people. So we know that the Biden administration is absolutist. I mean, it's part of his biography, uh, President Biden's biography, that, that his support for Israel is part of his DNA. Mm -hmm. uh, not so much, but I, I guess there's some faith component built in, but it's, it's literally part of his DNA mm -hmm. for whatever reason. But there are some hopeful, albeit small, but hopeful movements within Congress. Andre Carson, our uh, representative in Indianapolis, who we've hosted here in this building, uh, is one of them, and Rashida Tlaib and, and, and others. Talk about just your work with Congress and any kind of movement, hopeful movement that you've seen. Yeah. I'll, I'll be honest. I don't like the term occupied territory for Congress, and I'll tell you why. A couple of reasons. Number one, Everything that the American Israel Public Affairs Committee and other Zionist organizations are doing is within the framework of the law yeah. and within what is allowed to them. They're incredibly uh, effective. And yeah, they're good at it. And organized and disciplined and have tremendous financial means at their disposal to mobilize money for and against candidates. But everything that they do is done in a way that exploits all of the worst aspects of U.S. Um, electoral systems and campaign financing. So the Supreme Court really opened the floodgates yeah. to um, special interest groups to impact these congressional and presidential races in a way that was unfathomable a couple of decades ago through these super PACs and all these other designations that they have, 527s and so forth. 
Uh, that's, that's one reason. The other reason why I don't like to refer to Congress as, as occupied territories, because I feel it's disempowering to those who are working hard to change the dynamics. And there are a lot of organizations doing extremely effective advocacy on Capitol Hill, lobbying for Palestinian rights, you know, both those advocates in DC and amongst the, the grassroots. So yes, things are changing for the better. Uh, when I worked for Congress 20 some years ago, I could count on one hand and actually just on two fingers, the number of members of Congress who would express even a minimum of concern about the humanity and lives of Palestinians living under brutal Israeli military rule. No members of Congress were talking about ending US weapons to Israel. Right. No US members of Congress were calling Israel an apartheid state. Uh, none of them were introducing legislation that would try to put some human rights uh, rail guards on U.S. support for Israel. So, for example, I think about seven or eight years ago, Representative Betty McCollum of Minnesota introduced the first ever standalone piece of legislation designed to protect the human rights of Palestinian children and said, can we at least not provide weapons Israel for the purpose of imprisoning and maltreating and sometimes even torturing Palestinian children in a military judicial system that doesn't even offer the semblance of uh, the rule of law and due process? Can we at least do that minimum? So for her to break through that uh, silence and introduce that bill was, I think, a key turning point. And since then, more and more members of Congress uh, have spoken up in support of Palestinian rights. Uh, some of the members of Congress you mentioned are also in the leadership of that effort. Uh, and there are dozens of members of Congress who I would say are true allies and even champions of the human rights of the Palestinian people. So why do we see this situation changing in Congress? I think the reason why is because we're seeing a change in public opinion and we're starting to get elected to Congress representatives and senators who are actually reflecting the will of their constituents. So we've seen time and again, especially on the Democratic side, a huge shift in public opinion away from lockstep support for Israel and towards support for Palestinian human rights. So every year, the Pew Public Opinion Polling Organization does a survey of who do you sympathize with more, Israelis or Palestinians? And one generation ago, your party affiliation had no bearing on how you would respond to that question. It would be almost overwhelmingly, I support Israelis, whether you were Democrat or Republican. Since that time, there's been a steady decline amongst Democrats for sympathy with Israel and a huge increase in empathy with the denied human rights of the Palestinian people amongst Democrats. You've also seen a, a huge increase in support for Israel on the Republican side, which is why you see no Republican member of Congress, yeah. not a single one ever say anything about Palestinian human rights. But you, you do see that being reflected more and more on, on the Democratic side, uh, you know, and you know, there's a, a push and pull effect at play, right? It's not only that these members of Congress are responding to public opinion, but they're helping to shape it through their actions and their statement and their leadership as well. I have two more questions. Israel's uh, making no secret of their uh, intention to rid Gaza of as many Palestinians as, as possible uh, in order to maybe repopulate Gaza with settlers, maybe not, but, and there's all kinds of potential futures that are being offered. Um, so the simple question is, what's next? And if you had to put your futurist hat on, what's next and what happens when the fighting stops? I mean, ceasefire is a bare minimum, right? But what, what do you think will happen next? 
but even more importantly, what do you think should happen next? Mm. As an aspiring historian, I'm better at looking back <laughs> than trying to guess uh, what will happen in the future. But I'll say this. There have been various iterations of what Israeli governmental ministries and Israeli political leaders have been saying. Some have been pushing for there to be a quote-unquote sterile zone created in the northern part of the Gaza Strip to push the Palestinian population from the Gaza Strip further away from the armistice lines with Israel. That's the most benign version of uh, Israel's plans. The most extreme versions, which uh, have been articulated by the Israeli intelligence ministry, are a comprehensive plan to push out all 2.3 million Palestinians who currently reside in the Gaza Strip into the mostly barren Egyptian Sinai Peninsula. So in between these extremes of forcing Palestinians from the northern part of the Gaza Strip and concentrating them even more so in the southern part uh, of the territory and ethnically cleansing all of them, I think these are uh, the different scenarios that the Israeli government is looking at. Now, to its credit, the Biden administration has said that Palestinians should be able to return to their homes in the northern part of the Gaza Strip. To their credit, the Biden administration has said that it does not support the forcible displacement of Palestinians from the Gaza Strip into Egypt or any other country. But you know what? President Truman in 1948 also didn't support the forcible displacement of Palestinians yeah. from their homes. And he helped pass a resolution in the United Nations that said Palestinian refugees have a right to return to their homes at the earliest practicable date. The earliest practicable date was more than 75 years ago. So it worries me because the Biden administration has said Israel should comply with international humanitarian law. Israel should not engage in indiscriminate bombing. Israel shouldn't be targeting civilians. Yet, these pronouncements have absolutely no impact whatsoever on Israel's policies and actions. So if the Biden administration says, well, we don't, we don't support the forcible displacement of Palestinian people, what does that mean if there's no sanctions and threat and consequence behind that statement? And furthermore, what does it mean when the Biden administration proposes to Congress up to $3.5 billion for, quote, Gazans fleeing into other countries? This is what the Biden administration requested of Congress in its supplemental appropriation request, which also includes $14 billion more in weapons to Israel. So I just have a lot of concerns that despite the Biden administration's saying that it opposes the forcible displacement of Palestinians from the Gaza Strip, they're not actually going to do anything to stop it if it occurs. Who can push back? I mean, in other words, we hear about the absolute support of the United States for Israel. We know Israel is a nuclear country and with, with, a, with, with vast military resources uh, supported by the United States. Is there any entity or group of entities that have the either have the power or the moral authority or to push back against such a, a, a U.S. supported apartheid regime. I think we do. I think the people, we, we, we the, the people, people do. I think we the people have the responsibility to recognize that Israel's genocidal actions toward the Palestinians in the Gaza Strip are being done not only with our political support, but with our taxpayer dollars in the form of the weapons that the Biden administration is copiously sending to Israel. We are very much complicit in Israel's genocidal actions, which is why the Center for Constitutional Rights has filed uh, another separate uh, domestic lawsuit against President Biden and other Biden administration officials, charging them with acts of genocide. So 
we have the power, we have the responsibility as citizens of the United States to oppose in every way that we can the policies of our government that are contributing not only to the current genocidal actions against Palestinians in the Gaza Strip, but Israel's more than 75 year denial of self-determination to the Palestinian people. It really is up to us because it is not as, as, as horrific uh, as Russia's attack against Ukraine is, we're not responsible for Russia's actions. Russia is not committing that act of aggression and military occupation and the annexation of Ukrainian territory with any form of US support whatsoever. On the contrary, we've pumped almost $100 billion of weapons to Ukraine to help them fend off these acts of aggression. But we are very much complicit. Every action that Israel takes can only be done with the diplomatic, political, and military support that's provided by us as the US, as the US, and as citizens who can take action to change their elected officials and change the policies of their elected officials, we have the responsibility, the moral responsibility to do so. Final question. Um, tell us your story. What, what, what makes this issue, uh, especially justice and human rights uh, within Palestine and Israel, what makes this so important? For you, uh, what led you into this work? Mm. I have many, many family members who were killed in the Nazi Holocaust. And so when Jewish people say never again, what does that mean? In some instances, it has a particularistic and tribalistic incantation, meaning that this should never again happen to the Jewish people. And we need to do everything that we can to be muscular and aggressive and assertive to make sure it never happens again. That's one strand of thinking about what never again means. There's another strand of thinking about what never again means, which goes back to Raphael Lemkin, who I mentioned before as the um, originator of the word genocide and the inspiration behind the passage of the Genocide Convention which is that this type of behavior, this type of inhumanity inflicted on another people should never again happen to anyone, regardless of their nationality, regardless of their ethnicity, regardless of their religion. So when I see Israel denying millions of people food, and water, and medicine, and bombing their hospitals. I feel so much shame that the so-called Jewish state could be inflicting this on another people. This is what drives me. It drives me that Israel has been responsible for the dispossession of another people from their homeland, has been responsible for keeping Palestinians in refugeedom for 75 years, for establishing a settler colonial apartheid regime, one that the Israeli human rights organization B'Tselem calls a regime of Jewish supremacy from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea. And that is what it is. There are one set of laws and policies and practices that apply to Jewish citizens of the state of Israel and Palestinian people, whether they're nominal citizens of the state, whether they live under military rule in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, or if they're refugees who are forcibly expelled beyond the borders of their homelands. No matter which category of Palestinian an individual falls into, they are treated less than by Israel. And that less than dehumanization of an entire people is an abomination that must be dismantled. With that, Josh Rubner, uh, thank you for being with us.
Thank you very much, Michael.